make an introduction as well, and uh, we'll go straight then into uh, some quick presentations and then um, some moderated questions and then questions from the audience. So please, Shoshana. Yeah, my name is Shoshana Leib, and I work at the Core Technologies. I have a diverse background, actually. Uh, right now, I'm leading initiatives in the area of mobile uh, applications, cutting edge, next generation, and especially looking at the impact on uh, the middleware that the network operators, the carriers, can actually offer. So we look at the whole ecosystem end to end. Hi, I'm Troy Cross. I run sales for the Americas and Asia regions for a company called Lingo. And uh, we'll learn a little bit more about Lingo, but we deal in the um, mobile application user interface space um, with a special emphasis on speech recognition. And so we'll be talking to you a little bit about how speech and, and other kind of alternative UIs can be applied to social networks and we probably should do. So one of, one of the reasons the panel is organized the way it is is that it's important, I think, to show that there is an impact not only on the device manufacturers and how they interface with the social networks, but also the impact on the operators, both the existing and the emerging operators in the 4G space, as well as some of the impacts and, and things to think of as we actually start to adapt social networks that were generally constructed for offline util sorry, online utilization at a desktop or on a laptop and actually bring them into the mobile space. Uh, if you look at uh, the history of mobile and social networking over the past couple of years, I think you've seen a very, very dramatic adoption of social networking technologies in the past 12 to 18 months. If you had looked at mobile devices as shipped or as the variants shipped in the European markets or Asian markets, you've seen you know, effectively going very quickly from SMS-based solutions, uh, very primitive type to and from types of uh, technologies to a, a rash of embedded clients, starting, uh, I think, most notably by the iPhone uh, launch with the Facebook application. And uh, recently, our own devices, uh, the uh, Nokia 97, which is our flagship device, shipping, uh, depending on which market it comes in, with a variety of different social networking applications that are specific to the region uh, in which the device is offered. And I think. There is a, there's a definite need for us to actually consider how social networks will uh, evolve with the mobile networks over time. Um, if you look at the Facebook experience, which is very much uh, text and object driven, it, it adapts to the mobile environment actually very, very well. Um, whereas you get into the MySpace experience, which over the past 12 months or so has migrated more towards its roots as a music-oriented uh, social networking those technologies actually start to have dramatic impact on the operator in terms of consumption of bandwidth of streaming music, uh, as well as how you actually represent that uh, in a device that may or may not have the best acoustic quality. Um, of course, our device is not having that particular issue. Um, you also have to deal with the regional differences. A, an application, a device that might be manufactured for the North American market might not be appropriate, for example, in New Zealand, where Bebo is the most popular uh, social network in that area, or in India, where Orkut is, is more of an emerging force. Also, the ability for users to affordably access data services require different decisions to be made in this. So I, I think it's great that uh, we have panelists today that can discuss not only you know, the impact of you know, how these applications are portrayed on the device, but also those that can talk a bit about how these things can be offered in different markets and how operators can, can reutilize existing technologies and implement new ones to actually optimize towards this, uh, this new flow of data over the network. So with that, I'll pass it to Shoshana, talk a bit about um, the deployment of social networking technologies from an infrastructure perspective. So, I'll pass it to Shoshana. The will be better. Yeah. That'll be fine. Actually, I wanted to mention that we, I have hard copies. I, I was asked to bring copies of the presentation, so maybe it'll help if we distribute them. They're just next to you there. Sure. Uh, I was obedient. I actually did what I was asked, so I prepared the presentation and brought hard <laughs> copies. Yeah. All right. So what I'll talk about today is uh, I, we took a broad look at, uh, at Telcordia. We usually look at the big picture because we kind of believe we see the end-to-end -end, uh, play. And I took a broad view on, on when you bring social networking application into the mobile phone, what really happens. So uh, <clears throat> one of the things that happen is that you all of a sudden have location. Info. I mean, if you run a, a Facebook on your laptop versus if you run it on your mobile device, first of all, you have location. You also have a lot of sensors information all of a sudden available 
uh, you have acceler accelerometers, you also can, send, you can get information from, you can take pictures, you can do a lot of different things from the environment, which makes the, the social networking application richer and more complex. Uh, you can also enable uh, richer communication, I mean, all of this enables richer communication and also give rise to a whole bunch of issues, and some of them were mentioned in the previous panel. Uh, you have, uh, the devices are very diverse. I mean, you have a whole bunch of issues in terms of uh, device choices. Do you want to have a I mean, you can even imagine that you can have a special purpose device just for social networking. People will carry with them a little device like the Kindle, but it will be tailored just for social networking. It will be cheap. The, the data plan may be very inexpensive. It may not even have voice on it. So, I mean, you can imagine all these uh, uh, kind of scenarios with this kind of uh, environment. And then you have issues of privacy, obviously, because you know the location of the users. People are very sensitive to, look, to privacy. And also you have uh, the end-to-end -end business model issues. So <clears throat> if you look at the, I mean, the examples we looked at uh, quite a lot, uh, and we have some intellectual property around it, is the example of uh, the body locator services when you find out from your mobile device uh, who's near you that is on your body list. And this was actually offered, it's, it's offered on the Helio as a, an MBNO, basically, a type of application. But in, in this application, you can at any time see if your friends are around you. Uh, and, um, and you can also filter information based on the calendar, your calendar, your to-do list, and other things like that. So you can create a very interesting application running on a mobile device. And uh, it, uh, if you look at it, it can, I mean, it's very uh, interesting to have, but it can also, uh, uh, there are a whole bunch of challenges still facing us today to deploy it uh, in a, robust way. Now one, if you look at the, a way that you can actually deploy a service like this, you can imagine a cloud, you can imagine the internet, you can imagine a whole bunch of servers sitting in the cloud providing presence uh, information, location information, maps, and the application itself, and people can communicate, see each other, communicate and do the whole bunch of stuff that mobile, you know, social networking applications do. And the question is, the three questions that we looked at are, uh, again, like I mentioned, do you have one smart device that will do all the applications that you are looking for, or will you have specialized devices? Like I said, the Kindle, for example, for book reading is, is an example of a mobile device, a full-fledged mobile device, an MVNO-type deployment that is just for reading books and buying things from the Amazon store, for example, and it's very successful. Uh, would you look at the, I mean, the end-to-end -end ecosystem? Who will provide what? And we'll, we can look at, again, the user experience. How can users protect their privacy? I was even reading some articles uh, the other day, and I kind of thought of it myself afterwards, that it'd be interesting to know, for example, if somebody is Googling you right now, even on the web, would it be interesting for people to know who's looking to find out information about them? Now, on Google, it's not available. You cannot, nobody will tell you that somebody is now Googling you. But if you're talking about a mobile body locator, you may want to know who's about to see you. Who's, who's in the next one minute will actually see that you are around? And maybe opt in or opt out at that moment based on your real-time context rather than give a blanket opting in and saying, all the people from this list can see me when I'm you know, within half a mile away from them. You may want to see them case by case basis. And today it's not possible to actually support something like that. So there are lots of, I mean, uh, like I said, I mean, if you think about it, you may not mind your co coworkers or your friends seeing you, you know, down your body list. But suppose you go for a job interview in a building that one of your friends work in and you don't want to tell anybody that you're interviewing. He will actually see that you're in the building. And it may not be something that you wanted, but you cannot imagine that scenario in advance. So there were lots of experiments and studies that were done in different universities that looked into when people opt in to a social networking service. Do they really understand what they're opting in into? Can they really imagine all the possible ways that information can be used in real time? And the answer is no. So, so that's an issue. So in terms of device choices, I already mentioned that, you know, you look at the Kindle, you look at the navigation devices in cars, there are special purpose mobile devices. I mean, the, the navigation, turn-by-turn -turn navigation devices are becoming more and more like cell phones, mobile phones. They're all converging that way. But they're really specialized for a particular application at this point. You have the, the iPod Touch, you have the, the Kindle. Those are special purpose devices that are really phones at this point. So the question is, will the market go, in some cases, for the specialized devices, maybe for healthcare? Who knows? Or will they stick with a general purpose smartphone? Can we go to the next one? Again, I, I, the other issue that was raised in the previous panel, and I think it's a big deal, is how you pay for services will determine a lot of what you're going to do as a consumer. 
because the, uh, we notice a lot of times in, in the cases of telematics, for example, when you deploy a tel- a, 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 something like the Ford Sync in, in a car, there are lots of issues that have to do with the cost of the data plan. Lots of things you cannot do because it would be way too expensive in today's billing structure to actually deploy. Because people, I mean, many people actually don't want to have a data plan. I think only 25% in the U.S. of the phones actually have a data plan. So that's a problem. I mean, how, uh, will, will you allow prepaid? Will you allow uh, no monthly fees but something else? You know, it will uh, actually determine what services get deployed. And that's another uh, constraint on when you think about you know, penetration and deployment, how people are going to be able to actually buy those services. Now, the, that issue has to do with the MVNO model, which hasn't been too successful. Uh, we have a lot of experience with deploying, supporting MVNOs. Uh, Telcordia provide, is one of the companies that provide the MVNE platform, which is uh, you know, it's a platform that enables kind of a bridge between the carrier and the company that actually is visible to the end user. Does everybody know what an MVNO is? Uh, who doesn't? No, you don't. Okay, an MVNO is something like a branded credit card. It's kind of the same idea. You know, with a credit card, you can have a credit card from LL Bean, for example, but behind it there's a Visa. And behind, actually behind the credit card there's a bank, and then there's Visa or MasterCard that support the credit card itself. So you have three layers, basically, of service providers on top of each other. But what you know is that you got a card from Continental or LL Bean or USA or whatever. So that's a branded card that is, a, that is a kind of a, They are not really LL Bean or Continental don't really have a credit card company, but they are the ones that interface with you. So the same applies to phone. I mean, you can actually get a phone that has a name on it of a company that really doesn't own a network. All they own, uh, what they do is they support a service on top of a platform that then is supported by a network. So Kindle is an example of this. Amazon doesn't own a wireless network. Sprint actually provides the network. On top of it, there's a platform that supports the service, and then Amazon is branding it. So, so you actually have three different layers of players here. You have the network operator themselves, Sprint, Verizon, AT&T. And then you have the MVNE, which is the enabler, the mobile virtual network enabler, which provides services like activation of the phone, sometimes billing, uh, sometimes the you know, authentication and stuff like that. And then you have the actual branding of the service, which can be you know, uh, different things like the Helio phone. I mean, Virgin Mobile was the one that pioneered this type of a business model. So you can offer a mobile service and be known to the customer as a mobile service provider without actually owning a network or owning any infrastructure to support the service. And that was very actually popular because suppose you are Disney and you want to give your customers a phone and you want to say this is a Disney phone, for example, and and people will have special features on it like locating where the kids are. I mean, it was targeted actually towards kids, I think ages, I don't know, 10 to 14 or something like that. So it'll have special features on it. It'll look like a Disney. It'll be branded as a Disney phone, but it'll be supported by Sprint and, some, and, and a company in between that provides the billing activation and so on. So that's the business model, and it ended up being not popular. I mean, not successful. The MVNOs ended up not acquiring as many customers as they hoped for. So that's actually a question. Will this model work? And the reason I address it is because in the abstract to, the, to, to this panel, we mentioned the MVNO model. Okay. So I think I mentioned all of this. Uh, the wireless le- network carriers actually have a huge role they can actually play in this whole ecosystem, which has to do, they have access to location information. They can facilitate obtaining the location information. They can also do the billing uh, in a very cost-effective way uh, for the services if they would like to. And it hasn't happened yet. So that's a question, how is it going to evolve? Now, privacy, uh, I mentioned that users of mobile services, or in particular social networking on mobile phones, are really sensitive to their privacy. And I think uh, it will become even a larger problem in the future. And uh, <clears throat> I just mentioned before that, you know, when you're opting into a body locator, you, you don't actually know what you're opting in into. So one solution that you can imagine would be that, bet- that there will be a layer, and it can be provided by the operator or by a trusted third party, a layer that does authentication and authorization, it will be like a data registry that will actually allow the service providers to access information in a secure way uh, and will try to prevent as many you know, malicious use of the data as possible or can allow people to opt in and out in real time and stuff like that. So that's one possibility that we are looking at. So just to summarize what I said, I mean, the 
whole market and, and technology space are in a state of flux, and it, it will be in a state of flux probably for the next five to ten years. We don't know how all these mega forces, you know, in terms of all these technologies are becoming available, all the power of location and mobility uh, are playing into it, how it's going to actually resolve itself in terms of privacy. And uh, I think uh, I'll be interest, I mean, I'm interested in your opinions, and also we'll discuss it on the panel, how the marriage you know, of mobile technology and social networking, how it's going to evolve and what the issues that you guys are facing and interested in talking about. So, okay. okay. Uh, we can take two questions for Shoshana. Yes. I personally have not, and I was thinking just now that maybe in the area of telematics, you know, information to the car, it, there are a couple of natural plays for MVN, for MVNOs. One of them would be like if Ford or GM or, or, one of, or Audi or, you know, Mercedes would be a, an MVNO, and they'll actually offer their users a phone that can actually work with their car very well and stuff like that. That can be an advantage, but... Uh, right. I mean, right, right. Well, the, the MVNO that comes to mind would probably be uh, Virgin in the United Kingdom since they're a, a fully integrated operator. Um, they're actually a, have traditionally been an MVNO off of T-Mobile in the United Kingdom and has since uh, consolidated the Virgin Media Group to also include the largest cable operator in the country. Um, between that and I would think three, although that's a, that's a traditional operator, have both shown interest in trying to fuse together things like sling box technology in the case of three or some, some primitive uh, integration between, say, DVRs back at the household of the system. But from a social perspective, I don't think we've seen a um, uh, substantial driver on that. Now, in the U.S., we have seen, I, I can't remember which operator it was that that was trying, was actually doing some very public branding with MySpace Mobile a few years ago. Uh, wasn't, I don't think it was Sprint, I think it was one of Sprint's MVNOs, which was the, Kore the one off of that, uh, that the Korean telecommunication, SK was running. Um, was it Helio? Yeah, 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 yeah Helio. Yeah. Helio definitely tried that with the MySpace uh, area, but um, what I think we've seen in the last couple of, about probably six months or so, is actually a, a very rapid mainstreaming, particularly in the North American market, of uh, Facebook applications on on uh, specific devices targeted towards the, the Facebook core market, mm -hmm. the high-end feature phones, the smartphones that are targeted at the same base user group, 18 to 35, um, male and female. Uh, but, you know, MVNO, I, I don't think we've seen anybody break out in this space yeah. yet. And the whole, well, a whole bunch of them. I mean, there are many, many of them that maybe I've never heard of and we haven't made it. They all had optimistic business models, uh, business cases, but then it didn't work out. Yeah. So we don't know. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we are already seeing a lot of, there are lots of body, legislative bodies looking into this issue. And I think you'll continue to see this. I think the technology enables privacy, uh, the technology enables people to uh, lose their privacy much more easily now so that you'll see an accelerated rate of activities to actually protect privacy. But my view is that there'll always be a privacy problem. And we'll continue to constantly try to solve it. I mean, it's always an issue because it's a trade-off. If you want personalized services, if you want things to be with you and very personalized to you, Somebody out there knows a lot about you, so that you always have this balance. Yeah, well, yeah I, I think you also. I think it also represents you know, one of the primary reasons we see balkanization in the social networking space even today. Uh, from a, from a, an American-centric point of view, Facebook and, and and 
to a lesser extent, MySpace dominate that particular conversation. But, for example, when we launched in the Philippines, the N97, it was incredibly important for us to have Friendster on it. I mean, a North American customer would probably not care at all about Friendster or did not care about it in the last five years. Um, but the same same is true also in, with the case of Orkut in the Brazilian market and the like. And you know, I think part of you know, what you're saying here is, as far as privacy actually feeds into that. There are different expectations from a company that might have a European route versus a U.S. route. So I think that's one of the reasons why you see Bebo, for example, still having a fairly decent position in the U.K. and New Zealand and Australia markets. Um, but I think it also comes hand in hand with the advertiser subsidy piece of this as well. Uh, the, the broader the social network, the more difficult it is to monetize specific users in it. So, for example, someone launching a movie in the United States is not necessarily as interested in reaching the Indian market. Um, and you know, being able to balance the, the positive benefits of Metcalfe's Law, but also the negative aspects of Metcalfe's Law and the construction of these networks actually has some impact both on the, on the adoption around the privacy rules as well as the monetization models. So let's pass it on now to, uh, to Troy, who's going to talk a bit about the Vlingo application and sort of the, the challenges of deploying complex social networks on, in what are many cases, a, a limited form factor or a, a limited uh, input uh, method devices. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. You can do it the other side. So I'm actually not going to do a, you know, a Vlingo presentation for you. I mean, that's not why you're here. Um, but I will tell you just a little bit of, so give me just one slide, just to give you some background on who we are. Uh, so Vlingo is a, it's a voice user interface for mobile devices. Um, it's um, broader than social networking, but it certainly includes social networking as part of its, um, um, of its framework and the things that we like to support. And so our, our Overall vision is that a user should be able to pick up a device, hit a button, hit a soft key, somehow let the phone know you want to speak to it, speak whatever you want, and then we do the right thing. So it's a pretty broad vision, um, and, and in a lot of cases we're there, and in some cases we have some work to do. Um, but, um, but we still consider ourselves the only unconstrained voice user interface in, in the industry right now. And, and unconstrained in the speech world means not constrained by vocabulary. So, you know, um, an example of that is you call your airline and you can say agent, you can say reservations, you can say flight status, but you can't say pizza for grandmother, right? So things blow up at that point. Um, not to know what you want to say, but it, you could. I mean, but in a mobile application, um, if you're updating your status or, or doing something um, interactive with somebody, sending them a message, so you need to, and as, the speech recognizer needs to be able to understand anything you say. So that's that's what unconstrained is, and that's the requirement um, for our sort of technology. Um, so this is not your your grandfather's uh, speech recognition, like we used to say. This is dramatically different. Um, and if we have time, I'll show you a couple of use cases and, and, and focusing on a social networking status. Um, and, and what we like to say is, uh, Vlingo and our technology allows you to connect to your friends faster. Um, it's, I left that up there because I, that's actually, this is a slide that we put in front of our, every one of our presentations. Um, and I think that gets at the part of this panel is um, even someone like us who's selling general technology to the mobile, to mobile industry understands that connecting to friends and family, and in, in, in essence, social networking is, is an important part of the mobile experience today. Uh, so that's us, that's Flingo. So let me just kind of talk, we're just going to talk for now and um, ask, answer a couple questions and I'll do a couple risky live demos for you. Uh, so my premise here is that there are a lot of reasons why social networking um, is getting such traction in the mobile environment. Uh, so the things that these devices have going for them, right? So they're all connected. They're all connected at fairly high speeds now. Um, most of them at 3G, some now moving to 4G. So there's plenty of band bandwidth, so, and, they're, and they're connected to, uh, at almost all times, um, to the network in general. Uh, there's nice color, crisp screen, so the graphics show up well, pictures show up well, um, and all the other things that make social networking um, popular. And then uh, there's plenty of processing power. So if, you know, there's, I don't know of anything in the social networking space today 
even location-based services, that isn't easily handled in today's kind of modern handset. But the one area that does lack and does provide a limiting factor is the input method for the user interface. So on a touch screen like this, it's a big problem. And even in cases where there's a full QWERTY, it's just not as good as it would be in front of your PC screen, right? So it's better, but not ideal. And so that's where speech and other UI constructs can help kind of fix that end of that circle and make social networking applications easier to use for the user. So that's point number one. Point number two is, as the mobile, as the social networking applications become proliferated on handsets like this one, like the Nokias and across the world, is it's turning the social networking behavior from something that a user will do once or twice a day when they get home, or maybe when they first get to work or a couple times a day in front of their PC, to something that's real time, always happening to them. They're always checking it. They're always interacting. And so that is significant user behavior change. That's just by fact that these people have these devices with them at all times and they're always connected. And so what we like to say and we believe is that speech input, by the fact that it can be done on the go, even while driving, we'll talk about it in a second, because it's an important topic, but certainly while you're walking down the street, it's something that enhances the social networking experience. So just to give you an example, when people use a Glingo application to do status updates of things like Facebook or send tweets, the two most popular words that are, if you look at all the words and you tally them all up, do the word cloud on it, it's just and going. Right? So it just gives you a sense of the sort of immediacy that people are using, interacting with their social networking while on the phone. So I mentioned, so that's point number two. Point number three is the safety aspect. So I'm sure everybody has noticed this dramatic perception and realization by the country at large and the world at large about the problem of distracted driving. It happened about six years ago with just calling. So there's a large focus on making sure that people use hands-free handsets. People started getting, states started implementing laws that will make sure that you can only make phone calls when you're using hands-free handsets. Some states did, some states didn't, some countries did, some countries didn't. But there's a big focus and the industry came up with solutions for it and it sort of kind of died down for a bit. You know, the states that were going to do it did it and the states who were going to leave it alone kind of let it alone. But things have changed dramatically over the last year or so and mostly around driving while texting, right? That's the new buzzword, DWT, driving while texting. And so there's a kind of regulatory tsunami coming, in my opinion. There is a, in the United States, there's a federal commission that is meeting this month in September to talk about recommendations for the states on how to regulate distracted driving. And their inclination at this point is to ban it all. That you cannot, you won't be able to touch this phone regardless of what you're doing while you're on the phone, hands-free or not. That's the inclination and it's up to the industry as a whole to provide safer solutions to avoid over-regulation. And I'm not here to say that regulation in this area isn't required. Actually, I would support it. You know, but my personal bet on it is that we should lean towards finding safer solutions versus kind of over-reacting in general. But it's going to be up to, if the industry doesn't come up with solutions to kind of stem the tide, it's something that will happen. So safety is point number three. And I would just say for social networking on the safety issue is, I think it's a worse case, it's a worse use case than just driving while texting, right? It has all the badness of driving while texting, right? You're sending messages, you're updating status, you're doing stuff, plus you're trying to read whatever, what else is going on in the world. And so it's actually a worse issue and it will come up in discussions, I guarantee you. So those are my three points. And maybe I'll show you some demos. Again, the dreaded live demo. It'll work though. So this is Blingo today. It has some limited social networking. Sorry, I don't have the Nokia phone. No, it's okay. We'll just take it out of any future deals that we do. So this phone is just sitting at the idle screen and 
I can certainly do other, other things with lingo, like send text messages or make a phone call or send an email or even do a web search. But let's say I just wanted to update my Facebook status. So I'll pick up the phone. I'll hit this key from the idle screen. Update Facebook is giving a presentation in Los Angeles. So I said what I wanted to say. Can you see that? So you can see that it's, it's recognized the fact that I know it's a little blurry right here. It says it has a little Facebook icon. It says they're giving a presentation on Sanchez. And all I'll do is hit this update key, and uh, my Facebook is now updated. So it's as simple as that. And maybe I'll just hit a Twitter or a tweet. Update Twitter is on a panel on social networking. It's kind of great. Update Twitter is on a panel on social networking. It's connecting, connecting. I'm having a network problem. Yeah, it's, it's obviously that substandard device you're using. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, but you get the point, right? Yeah. So, um, so Twitter, up, you know, Facebook, and but that's the uh, that's the use case, right? So you'll be able to do that um, on the go, um, and, um, and in cases where. Uh, um, you know, where it could be safer for you to use something like that versus uh, typing in. So, Shoshana brought up the, the topic of contextuality, and obviously contextuality in terms of geolocation and, and the like is, is, is slightly different than the problem you're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. But uh, what's the role of, of, of context within the voice recognition space? I mean, obviously there's nuance in speech and determining, um, you, know, you know, the there, there, there is a perfect example of that. Uh, how how do you see that type of complexity uh, in this space actually conveying to your UX issues? Um, yeah. So it's a good question. I mean, so there's a, some things that we can do. Uh, so I'll go back to our vision, right? Yeah. So understand what the user wants to do. Well, so what I said in the previous is understand what the user said and do the right thing. Right. It's actually broader than that. It's understand what they want to do and do the right thing because right. Um, what they said could mean a couple of different things is probably your point, right? Yes. Um, so uh, there's a couple things that hand ways to handle that. Um, in our particular technology, we're um, adding on infrastructure in, in our overall architecture. It's called an intent engine. So we have a speech recognition engine. And now we're creating an intent engine to help figure out what that user typically does, mm -hmm. pay attention to, to trends, um, you know, what sort of applications are they uh, are they subscribed to sort of application or device? And those sort of things help us determine what the user wants to do. Right. So, I mean, the, the, the although I, I doubt most people use the term limp biscuit in, in regular conversation, I mean, yeah. there, there does need to be a distinction between when talking about perhaps a, a soggy cracker and a rock band. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And that's right. And so part of that is the intent engine side. So we just try to make the best guess. Okay. And part of, but sometimes we just make it, we make the wrong guess. Um, and you know maybe a more trivial trivial example than the Limp Biscuit is you know Red Sox right. Um, most of the time, someone says Red Sox in the Boston area, they're looking for the Boston Red Sox. Well, it could be that they are actually shopping, right? Yes. Um, and S O X is not their correct spelling of Red Sox. It's S O C K S. Um, so when those things happen, we want we want to make it user within the UI. And this goes back to this isn't all about speech. This is a multimodal UI experience. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, that socks is spelled wrong. Click on socks. Pull down a menu of all the alternative spellings of socks or other things that the user might have said, maybe a fox, um, and let the user make the change on the fly. Right. And the idea is, is not letting the user get frustrated because the recognizer makes a mistake. So, so, so to both of you, would you say there's a role then in actually not only deriving you know, the, per the person's intent but also utilizing context Absolutely. as part of that. That's right. So, I mean, the, to your example there, if a user is in Boston talking about the Red Sox, we're talking most likely with the X. Uh, if they're in New York, um, they're probably also talking that's about right. the Red Sox, except for there's probably a, an obscenity involved right. in the that's conversation right. as well. But out in Chicago, for example, that, that you know, you, to again, your shopping case here. So how do, how do you deal with that in terms, uh, how do you see us dealing with that in terms of something like Facebook? Um, yeah, if somebody was to say I am you know, out for the Reds, uh, out for Red Sox, mm -hmm. um, I mean, 
not saying it's perfect grammar by any means. I mean, eventually we're going to have to come to a means by which, you know, deriving at least the basic intent is going to come from knowledge by the recognition engine of location or knowledge of, of, of previous. Yeah, and, um, and right. another source would be the calendar. I mean, if on your calendar you have a certain appointment, you're going somewhere, that's right. you can get that right. too. Uh, yeah. yeah, and location is really important. Um, you know, it's important from the standpoint of, of finding out what the user wants to do. So if I say, uh, you know, social networking example, that could be something like, tell me, tell me where Joanne is right now and give me directions to her, right? So there's a couple things that has to happen. We have to recognize what she said, mm -hmm. um, or he, he or she said. We have to figure out a way to find out where Joanne is. We're probably not doing that ourselves. We're probably interacting with another social networking application on device, get that information, um, and then passing that information to some sort of mapping or navigation application. Okay. Uh, so we'll take one question here from the audience, and then I'll, I'll, I'll ask a question. We'll keep going back and forth until uh, we either fall over from exhaustion or we mm -hmm. run out of time. Mm -hmm. So please, sir. The question was, how, how can businesses benefit from this technology? Yeah, I mean, so we, we certainly key on productivity from that's when we talk to businesses, that's that's our lead. Um, uh, if this is, allows users to, to do what they're doing um, faster and better and, and while on the go, so where they don't have to find a, a spot where they can sit down and, and type and use speech to kind of continually interact with the, with their services, whether those are business services um, or others. Um, safety is also key. I, I think safety is an important message for employers. Um, you know, we're, we're as a, just as a slightly side note, we're getting interest from people like insurance companies to give customers discounts for using technology like ours. Uh, I'm not saying we're the only one, but using technologies like ours. And the third aspect is to to use this sort of application to front in other services that the business may have already sucks. So we don't create as as a UI supplier, we don't create social networking applications or navigation or, or even search applications. We're sim sim simply a UI to those existing apps. So one of those existing apps could be a uh, CRM tool, right? Um, so the user could pick, the, as a use case, the user could pick up the device and say, um, you know, uh, look up, um, you know, contact, sales contact, John Jones, right? And that could pull up their sales their, their CRM tool and give them information as they're walking into a meeting. So just an example of other kind of business uses that it can have. Yeah. Um, ask me one more time, sorry. Right. Um, Right now, we're essentially a mobile company, so we're working with folks like uh, with Nokia and obviously um, these folks to uh, to put these devices on there. I mean, I think the capability is certainly there. There's actually very little going on on the client. Most of the most of the smarts is in the network, so that client could go in a lot of places. Uh, but I think to to get to your the root of your your original question, um, I I think at, at this point in the deployment of the technology, we're at the consumerization aspect first, mainly because of the fact that there's a higher tolerance for error. There's, a, there's, an, there's an opportunity for us to actually try out what works and what doesn't. And I think if you, you've seen some of the early uh, contextual services that have been deployed out there, um, Places, which we acquired roughly a year ago, Looped, um, some of the stuff that Google's doing with Latitude. I mean, at, at the beginning, we're talking about this as, uh, as basic friend finder type of applications. So establish a social graph utilize location either in a very specific form via GPS or in general terms, uh, cell tower ID, for example. Um, you know, establish this, test out, see what works and what does not. Try to actually uh, deploy the technology in a way where we actually get some reliability in the technology and, and some scalability in the back end. And I can see that technology actually very rapidly being deployed from the social networking context into things like group telematics. So being able to use it as uh, truck tracking software 
in a in a more open standpoint than we do the existing systems now, which are based on proprietary radio and 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 location technologies. So uh, I think I think one of the nice things about sort of the the mass consumerization of things like GPS technologies and mobile devices has actually opened up uh, a giant laboratory for these basic contextual services. And um, I think we're right now in the, you know, we're, we're not quite to the Roman phase yet. We're still, you know, throwing rocks at each other as far as I think the technology is, is, uh, is actually capable of. And I think in the last 12 to 18 months, we've seen a rapid proliferation in contextual-based services, particularly around location. And I think, I think location has, has come out to be actually one of the key, um, you know, test cases for how contextual services actually get deployed here. As you can see, we've already gotten into the impact of location services on basic text inputs based on geography. Um, not only, not only can, I, can I anticipate us actually looking for the difference between red socks and white socks and, 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 and shopping, but also trying to actually tune some of these engines based on the current location. So Scottish English, if you've ever worked in the United Kingdom like I have, is far different than, than English English versus American English versus accented Finnish English. And uh, you know, having some basic understanding coming into the initial transaction as to where this user is actually homed and, you know, actually can increase, I'm assuming, some of the accuracy associated with you know, not only you know, you know, what the user is going to say, but also the actually how the user is going to actually function with the network. An Indian customer, we can make different basic um, assumptions about the use cases that an Indian customer is going to use. They're going to use Orkut more likely than Facebook. They're going to use. Now they're, they're they're less likely to have a data plan than say someone in Finland. Um, that's going to change over time. But again, having having just information such as basic location gives us an opportunity actually to derive better contextuality for services going on. And I think if anything, this the, the proliferation of consumer contextual services will get into the enterprise space probably faster than we're comfortable getting them in there. And I think you know to the issues you were raising here as far as the social contract and privacy, actually, in many cases, I think this technology is going to run ahead of people's comfort level on you know, how, how can your, if your employer gives you a cell phone, can they track you throughout the business day? I mean, it's a business tool. It has that capability. How do we engage in that? I think it's going to be different in each market. Um, so I think we're, we're like I said, we're, we're, we're on the road to Rome when it comes to the proliferation and, and the ideal state for these types of things. But... Um, yeah, I, th I think the enterprise technologies are going to lag in the developer community because there's such a there's such a huge amount of money right now behind trying to find a contextual based service that works for the uh, for the Facebook crowd or the MySpace crowd or the Orchid crowd. Did I answer your question? Or do you, Shoshana, do you want to no, add anything? I, to that? Yeah. Go to bit. Yeah. Are we? Are good. Please to the back here. Or we're going to sell 400 million cell phones this year. I think that, I think that's our general model. Um, it, it, but I think if you've looked at Nokia over the past uh, 24 months or so, we've launched an initiative called OV, which is a, a services-based organization. And if you look at the, the general construct of our applications um, and the people we're doing business deals with, and Vlingo is, is one of those you know, partners as well, in actually trying to figure out how best to deploy these types of services within within our devices. Uh, but our, our focus in, in how we're innovating now is actually, uh, you know, to, to take a, a, a different analogy than Rome, is it, we're, we're at the point now where we're at the, the beginning of the space age. And we've started actually seeing the mobile device almost as a Voyager probe for, the tw for, for individuals in the 21st century. Our emphasis is on actually taking the contextuality that's trapped in the device and actually try to find ways to unleash it in a variety of different contexts. So, for example, um, listening to music on your device right now um, is a generally discarded piece of information. So I can listen to songs. An iPod, for example, might track when the last time you listened to the song and how many times you've listened to that song in that particular iteration. And that's, that's fed into the genius functionality. But I think that there's, there's actually a, a, a deeper way to actually explore that. So, for example, if I listen to... Feist, for example, to pick a Canadian band to keep you comfortable and try not to go too far off of the privacy thing, but uh, I'm assuming Canadian, you've got a Feist album in there somewhere, right? Okay, good. Good, good choice. Um, not, only, not only should I be able to use that 
to actually determine what other music I might listen to. But I also might want to use that at Match.com, for example, to determine, you know, find someone to date that has a similar music taste. I might actually want to use that in an advertising context to actually define when the next Feist concert is going to be in the, in the local area. And because I know the location of that person as a second element that I'm tracking as part of the contextual services infrastructure, we actually know where you are. We, and, I mean, one of the most frustrating things in being in L.A. today for me is I'm a big music fan. And I would love to be able to walk in, have all of my music library mind, my location mind, and be able to take all that information and find the absolute perfect concert for me to go to tonight after the show. Now, these types of technology, these things are on the horizon as things that we can do. But first, we need to come up with a concise, cross-correlated, time-correlated view of people, because in five years, you might not be listening to Feist. You know, that information is no longer relevant. So... To me, this, this Voyager probe into the person's life, which is represented by the mobile phone, and the services that we at Nokia are building within the OB ecosystem to, to highlight the types of information that users currently discard and actually take it not only into traditional monetization models like music, but also find alternative monetization models. Some of them might be advertising-based. Some of them might be ultimately um, partnerships with things like Live Nation or Ticketmaster. I mean, any number of different things can come out of this. But I think we've gone from this sort of this basic mashup of information that's available on the Internet, and we're now looking at is how do we mash up the information that's in the services cloud with information that we know about the user either in a historical standpoint or at the real-time aspect. And I think that's really where we're going to see a huge proliferation of new models and new businesses, and I think that's ultimately how we monetize this. Um, you know, some of it might be through Facebook, some of it may be through MySpace. I mean, MySpace has done, a, I think, an excellent job in carving out a very specific community around music. And I think that the information that, that we have trapped in our devices today and we're bringing into Nokia Music and the like is actually a, a very powerful means by which we can actually compel the user to other actions. Um, Shoshana? Yeah, I mean, I agree that personalization and, and creating a user profile with all the context in it, because you, you may have different preferences in one context versus another. You know, tonight you may yes. want to, but when you're driving to work, you may want to listen to other music. I mean, it depends on, so there are lots of complexities in personalization, and I think that's the next frontier, actually. Yeah. Actually, I saw one of the venture capitalists uh, talking about it, saying that it will be the next Google or eBay in terms of the size of a business, a business that can actually tackle the personalization mm -hmm. problem. I think it's a very large